this uh, next slide kind of sums it up. There's a rose in the back. This year, thousands of men will die from stubbornness. Somebody put graffiti on it. No, he won't. <laughs> yeah, that, that could have been me. Uh, I went in to save $250 on my health insurance and ended up saving my life. Now, I'm going to tell you how I did that in 87 easy steps. <laughs> that would be the number of steps from my parking spot into my doctor's office to take the PSA test. Um, 2014 was going to be the banner year. My wife and I turning 50. Please don't tell her I told you how old she is. Uh, the nest was empty and looking forward to celebrating 30 years of marriage. We got married at 12. Um, that changed with a cancer diagnosis. Just to give you a backdrop, I was traveling back from visiting my daughter in college. Uh, ended up in the ER. Failed the stress test miserably. Ended up with a several day stay in the hospital. Ran a litany of tests, checking for all the usual suspects. Didn't find anything. Put an IV in me. Said it's probably one of those unknown bacterial infections. You're good. Go home. I did. Several months later, the symptoms returned. And this time, uh, a broader group of tests. CAT scan, MRI, ultrasound. Checking for bladder cancer, liver cancer, stomach cancer. Um, all negative, which is good, but in sitting down with my doctor, he said, you've had about a million dollar workup, we can't find out what it is. So we started talking about my lifestyle, my work lifestyle, my workaholism, thank you, dad. And uh, he said, it's stress. I laughed, he didn't. He said, you have to understand, stress can mimic the very diseases we just tested for. You need to change. Okay, great, I'm a guy. I can change stress, that's lickable, no problem. Million dollar workup, found nothing wrong with me. I never have to go to the doctor again in life because I'm healthy as a bear. Sure. Until I wanted to save $250 on my <laughs> health insurance. So I went in for the uh, health assessment. Got a call from the doctor a few days later. It's probably nothing, but your PSA, which is only 4.3, is a little higher than I'd like it to be for somebody your age. So I'm going to refer you to a specialist, your urologist. Okay. Did I go? No. I'm a guy. I'm healthy. I'm Superman. Waited several months. I eventually went in to see the urologist, and he goes, you're probably going to be just fine, but given your uh, demographic, given your family history, I'm the tenth person in my family with prostate cancer, four of them no longer with us. Uh, my mom had breast cancer, which increases the chance of prostate cancer. Uh, let's go ahead and do a biopsy. And uh, worst possible you know, side effect, you may get a bacterial infection, no problem. Okay, fine, so we did. Uh, a few weeks later, we're, we're back in for the results, I'm sitting down with my wife and the doctor, and he goes, so, we got the results back? Got a little adenocarcinoma, and I'm like, hey, adenocarcinoma, no problem, got that licked. Didn't realize that was the clinical term for cancer. <laughs> That's the bad news. Um, I can't tell you what happened after that. I can't tell you the conversation that occurred. Thank God my wife was in the room. I can't tell you what went on in my head. Oh my God, I'm going to die. Oh my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And I came to my senses. There's nothing new about that statement. Every single last one of us are going to die. It's the rule of life. Nobody gets out alive. Every single last one of us has an expiration date. But it's something when the doctor pencils yours in and hands a pencil and says, your move. Um, surgery, not a consideration. Uh, my dad had gone through this, spent a couple of weeks in the hospital, seven days in ICU, saw what he had gone through, not fun. And let's face it, I'm a guy. We're not operating on that. No, not happening. So I did my research on the internet. And we all know that everything you read on the internet is true. <laughs> so my grand plan was to move to Washington or Colorado to deal with this. <laughs> it was at a follow-up appointment uh, when I was looking at the nurse and she looked me in my eyes and she said, if you were my husband, I would make you have this surgery. Well, that follow-up appointment was for the seventh prescription for an antibiotic for the bacterial infection that I had gotten from the biopsy. 
One of those was a 14 day IV. I lost a lot of weight, which is good. Not the way you want to use, lose it. So then I came to my senses. If prostatitis, an infection in the prostate, could cause me this much illness, pain, suffering, what would cancer do? So then it came to my senses, made the decision, it's got to go. Which wasn't an easy decision. My, uh, given our wonderful economy, my wife works in Jacksonville and I work in Boca. It's supposed to be for about six months. Um, it's been almost eight years. We get to see each other once a week. So, I, uh, I opted for the um, radical prostatectomy, which was the uh, minimally invasive robotic uh, laparoscopic uh, say that you, 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 robot. Um, I recall heading up the surgery, and uh, you, you, when you're dealing with this, you can go one of two ways. Give in to anxiety or have a sense of humor, I chose a sense of humor. So we're walking up to surgery, pre-op, felt like a death march, and I said, hey, lighten up. I'm the one headed upstairs about to be spayed and neutered, so... <laughs> Now when I got up there and they put the wristband on me and it had a GPS tracking device in it, I thought twice about that <laughs> statement. Uh, pretty straightforward procedure. You go in, they uh, blow your stomach up with gas, make five little incisions, put all the tools and video cameras and all the equipment in there. Doctor goes and sits at his video screen and plays a game, does some uh, reconstructive moving stuff around, moves a bunch of bits and parts is out, takes it out and uh, puts a catheter in, sends you back to your room. Okay, fate fairly straightforward. Makes you walk that night. That wasn't so fun. Found out that I do have some remnants of a six pack. Um, and uh, then they have you, you know, come back uh, about a week later, have the catheter taken out. Yeah, interesting story. So we're back in to have the catheter taken out. And when you go in, if you've ever gone through this, they give you 150 milliliters of water. And they said, this is a loan. We want this back. Okay, this belongs to us. We need to make sure the plumbing's working. So we're going to pour this in. You walk around the room, you take your time, you, you know, but you got to return it before you leave. So otherwise the catheter is going back in. So I'm walking around the room with my best concentration and it, no, and I didn't want that catheter back in. And I'm just, oh man. And, uh, I don't know if any of you have been to, to uh, Orlando, Twisty Treat, best ice cream in the universe. So my wife, bless her heart, goes, hey, honey, after we leave here, we get to go to Twisty Treat. <laughs> as, a, uh, <laughs> as I was doing my research on this, I was uh, mortified by the thought of wearing diapers. It depends. They've come a long way. Sense of humor. Remember all that weight I lost to the infection? Put the first one on, looked over at my wife, and said, sexy, and I know it. <laughs> Coping with cancer is a mental challenge. When you are diagnosed, when you hear those words, or someone you know, or someone you love hears those words, the mental train wreck that occurs in your mind, the thinking of the past, uh, thinking of the future, attacked by the what-if monster, um, is overwhelming and is very challenging. Uh, I had to, as we all, as survivors and caregivers of survivors, figure out a way to cope with this monster in our heads. The thought of something inside of us eating us alive. Um, and it had to come to a reality that living in the now, in the present, in this moment. Yesterday promptly ended last night. It's gone. Bill Gates can't buy five seconds of yesterday. The future, when it occurs, happens in the present, in the now. So all we ever really have is now, this moment. And in my circumstances, and perhaps others have experienced that, sometimes you can be, feel very isolated. You can feel very lonely. Again, whether you are researching because you've recently been diagnosed, recovering, uh, reassuring someone you're supporting or remembering someone you've lost, it can be very overwhelming. And sometimes you feel like giving up. Sometimes you feel like, I just can't do this anymore. And we've heard the term YOLO, you only live once. I had to get to the point was, 
I'm going to face this regardless. I'm still here. And if the only thing I can do is have the volition to carry on, to continue to march forward, regardless, I don't control the future, the, the past is gone, but just to, to exist, I'm going to continue to do that. I had to remind myself, you are alive, Y-A-A, -A. you are alive. And as a survivor, as a caregiver, as someone fighting towards this, sometimes you got to yell, yah, in your head at the monster that's in there worried about the future and worried about the past. One of the things I came across was, what if, actually before I go there, in the confrontation between the river and the rock, the river always wins, not by strength, but by perseverance, staying the course, staying steady, staying at it. One of the things I ran across additionally was, what if you woke up one morning and somebody deposited $86,400 in your bank account? With the only caveat being you had to spend every penny of that, that day and that day only. You couldn't carry one penny into the next day. Well, I've got great news for you. That happens to every one of us every day as it relates to time. Every one of us gets 86,400 seconds to spend every day. How we choose to spend them is our choice. One of the things I recall in going through this process was what it meant to me to have the support of my family, to have the caregivers there holding my hand, rubbing my head, just being present. That was therapeutic. The care from the HCP, the, the support staff, the nurses that they took to take my temperature, unforgettable. And in that process, it made me want to give back. It made me want to make a difference because I received care and I'm still here for a reason. I remember sitting down with the doctor in the post pathology report. We were going through it. With prostate cancer, the only way to know for sure is to take it out. So in the biopsy, less than 5% one side. They took it out, 15%, both sides at the base about to spread on a prostate that was three times the normal size. I recall talking and it was chilling to my doctor afterwards. You had about another six months before things were gonna go really bad for you. I dodged a Scud missile matrix style. And then he said to me, these results are favorable and they could be seen more often, but men don't like to talk about it. And that struck a nerve. And it was that moment I vowed to spend the rest of my life talking about something that nobody wants to talk about, to raise awareness if one life is spared, one quality of life is spared, it's worth it. I feel like my life was spared for a reason and I'm going to put that to good use, to talking about something to make a difference. Initially, I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to have a discussion about it, but I can't stop talking about something that is a taboo subject that guys are, I'll say, embarrassed about talking about. So with learning that there are opportunities uh, to speak about this, there are different organizations, and the American Cancer Society being one of those, being able to partner up with the American Cancer Society crossed my path, and I'm thrilled to be able to do that. And imagine, I, hadn't, I haven't been to a relay, I've been with my daughters, or they've gone, and I've supported them writing out the checks from a distance, despite all that cancer in my family. But when it affects you personally, you join forces and you're all in. Imagine my surprise, and happiness to find out that the American Cancer Society funded the research to create the very test that saved my life. So I'll, I'll leave you with this. Three simple philosophies that I live by in life. One of the reasons I'm talking about this is and why I love talking about this is this year 230,000 men are expected to be diagnosed with prostate cancer. About 29,000 men will die from prostate cancer. So those three simple philosophies that I live by is rule number one. In what you do, do what you love. Number two, if you're unable to do what you love, find something to love 
about what you do. And rule number three, if you're unable to do one or two, love yourself enough to make the change to be able to do one or two. I applaud each and every one of you survivors and every one of you caregivers for being here, for continuing on, for being champions, for being in an elite group, and for being the supporters, the, the caregivers that helped us get there. Thank you for allowing me to share my story.